Uh, I was just uh, a, a recent graduate of uh, University of Utah when this happened, and uh, this was right at the beginning of the space program. I couldn't have come along there at a better time <clears throat> because this was right uh, uh, just at the beginning of the space program. I, I got out of uh, school about 1957, and as you might remember, that was just a, a year or so before the, the uh, Russians launched their, their Sputnik probe. <clears throat> So uh, I didn't even know at that point that space flight would even be possible, although I had, as a lot of you, I think, been very interested in the ideas since I was a child. I grew up uh, thinking about it and uh, reading science fiction and the whole thing, thinking that maybe that was a long way off, but boy, we'd sure better learn how to do it. And maybe by the time we're done here today, I can uh, tell you some of the reasons I think it's so important that we keep working with it. and. Uh, and learning how to use spaceflight. It's not just something that we do for exploration. It has some practical answers to many of our everyday problems. At any rate, I, I found myself in a position where I uh, was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in Pasadena, California. And this was a tremendous lab. Some of you know that uh, that is the laboratory that's developed most of the important uh, robotic uh, spacecraft that we've used to explore the outer solar system and Mars and so on. The, the Mars rovers were uh, built there and controlled from there. So a lot of things uh, came from JPL. But I was there at a time before the space program started. Uh, I knew that there was something going on. There were some quiet things going on. Uh, I, I was interested in solid propellant rockets. Let me show you one here. <coughs> some of you may recognize this uh, rocket. Some of you may not. Uh, this was just a small scale of a, of a rocket we were using for a battlefield rocket we were developing. And I noticed there was a lot of interest in this one here, this, this one this size, because it turned out to be the solution to our access, first access to space. Let me show you a picture. <clears throat> Some of you may have seen this picture in a book. How many of you have actually seen that picture before? What you're seeing there are, some, are three very uh, famous people. On the uh, left of the picture is William Pickering. He was the director of the JPL when I was there working uh, as a young a student. Uh, in the middle is Dr. Van Allen. He's the discoverer of the Van Allen belts that we know are an important uh, part of the Earth's at upper atmosphere. And then on the right is a famous guy. I bet you guys can recognize him. That's Werner von Braun. One day when I was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory there that first year, uh, I went to the uh, cafeteria and there sitting in a, on a ta at a table were a bunch of important looking guys and at the head of the table was this man right here, Werner Von Braun. And uh, I ran back to my office. I have a book that he wrote called The Mars Project, which I was always fascinated with. It showed how mankind could eventually explore Mars. Ran back and I had him sign that, uh, that book. So. Uh, I knew something was up, okay, and it turned out that it had a lot to do with that little rocket motor that I was showing you, and here you'll see them holding it up. The, the rocket motor that they're holding there is just the same as that one I just showed you there. Hooked onto it at the front was the Explorer 1 satellite. That was the uh, U.S. Uh, first uh, orbiting uh, device. That was built there at JPL and what, what, while I was there. I didn't really know what was going on, but we found out later what, what the secrecy was about. And that was our answer to the Sputnik, which the Russians had uh, flown earlier. So this was an ex a really exciting thing to, to be involved in. And of course, I was highly motivated. Later on, I was able to uh, come up with some ideas for some innovative ways to explore uh, the outer solar system. As a graduate student, a little bit later, they asked me uh, to uh, look at ways to get to the outer planets, uh, Jupiter uh, and Saturn and so on. And uh, at that time, it was thought to be virtually impossible to do that. And uh, came up, though, with a way of doing it. We'll maybe talk about that if you have some questions about it later. We came up with a scheme called Gravity Assist, which is a way to get something for nothing in a way. By flying past a, a planet, we can gain some. Uh, here is the trajectories that I've was able to find that allowed us to get into the outer solar system. Uh, the thing that made it all possible, number one, uh, was that all of the planets turned out to be uh, on the same side of the sun 
during the, a period of the late 1970s. Now, I began that work in uh, about 1964, 65, and so that was only about five years in the future that we could do things like this. I was very lucky that we had the opportunity to look into that then. But having all the planets on that same side of the sun enabled us to uh, use the gravitational swing by effect, which we can talk about here in a minute. Uh, so I, I, if I can just get to Jupiter, then I can get all the way out of the solar system. That was the trick here. If uh, Jupiter was not there, I would just fall back on, a, a, on a, an elliptical trajectory back to the Earth's orbit. But with Jupiter there, I can fly past Jupiter, pick up a huge boost of energy, and then be swung by really fast out here to Saturn, do the same thing at Saturn, we get a boost of energy there, onto Uranus, onto Neptune. I did some trajectory calculations that showed you could get clear out here, out to Neptune in about seven years. Now the actual Voyager trajectory, which you see here, was, uh, was uh, set to take uh, about 12 years, and that was so that they could get good pictures of all of the satellites of each of the planets as they went by. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen pictures of, of the Voyager uh, mission. How many of you have seen some of the results of that mission, the planet pictures and so on? Okay, so most of you probably have. And that's how that was done. Oh, good. Okay. So I don't have to tell you too much about this kind of stuff. But here's the point of this. <clears throat> uh, number one, we've been able to, we've learned a way to get all the way out of the solar system. That uh, Voyager spacecraft is, is now on its way to a, another star, okay? Don't hold your breath, though. It's going to take about 30,000 years before it approaches another star. It's, it's the fastest object ever made by man, but it's still going to take about 3,000 years to uh, 30,000 years to get to another star. It's going really fast, but that's not fast enough to, to do.